morning, good morning, good morning. This is Apostle Love. How are you doing? I am amped. I am excited. I'm amped up for reasons that I really want to go into, but I can't. But I just want to encourage somebody that might uh, be checking this out. God, <laughs> God got a plan for you. You're not out here just kicking in the wind. You're ambitious and your your ambitions are not your ambitions. They belong to God. He just trusted you with them. You didn't fail. You didn't miss it. But God is causing those lost dreams and ambitions to come back to life so that you will see and understand that you are always the one. For the job. My belly is filled and full this morning. Um, you know, God knows how to talk to his babies. And um, I wanted to share a little bit of what he uh, woke me up with this morning. And it came out of prayer. Some of us are just visionaries. We see a lot. We want a lot. We're not locked in the box of religion. And uh, the church would have you to think that you have to sit in their box and do it their way uh, uh, in exchange for something else. And I began to seek God. I, well, let me say it another way. I had been seeking God on some answer to some things and some confirmation before I did some things. And this week has been nothing but confirmation when I wasn't looking for it. But it was on last night that... Um, you just have my one-on-one -on -one talks with God, you know, where you just begin to say stuff like, if this isn't what you want me to do, if I missed it, if I messed up falling short, let me know. Did I miss it? Well, what about this? And what about that? Forgive me for anything I have squandered, whether that be time, resources, just one of those heart to heart talks with God and to wake up and to hear him say, not just well done. I, I get that, but I'm talking about everything I told you to do. The gloves, the restraints are off. Do it and watch me do it through you. So excited about some things that um, are coming out. Um, other uh, Facebook pages I have, I will uh, make you aware of them and share them because of what God is doing. And I think that as you get to understand and to know my heart and as it relates to Church of the Outcast, and I, you know, I realize all y'all see is the part that says revolution, but there is a whole other vision of Church of the Outcast that you guys are not seeing yet. And it's not on purpose. It's just for right now, the prophets, you are the priority. I mean, I can't, I can't say it any other way. You are God's priority for the next year. And that means that as we end the year and we open up Church of the Outcast and we take it public, with all of its uh, intrinsic details and whatnot, you will see the original uh, intention of it. But for now, this is the assignment. And this is why it is important to be a prophet and to obey God and not to do things when you want to do it and how you want to do it. You know what I mean? But enough about that. Just be encouraged. So we left off last week with Shamar. Um, I debated whether or not I was going to finish it. And the reason I'm saying that is because the only part I did not talk about was colonization. All right. And so when you colonize something, just think of our people coming from Africa, our ancestors coming from Africa, and then coming over here to America um, and then being assimilated. So you colonize, you collect them, you pillage them. Um that's a type of colonization in the hopes that you will uh, assimilate them into the culture. Um, and of course, our assimilation was slavery. But we use that term in the sense of, uh, to get you to understand that in the Old Testament, hear me, 
in the Old Testament, land was the priority. Okay? That's why there was always a war for land. So what does land mean in the New Testament? Or what is land the foreshadow of? People. Souls. The enemy is trying to colonize souls. So our job is to, um, they're going to be assimilated into the kingdom of darkness or into the kingdom of light. So we must understand and take more serious what our job is. Um, and as we go through the lesson today, is why I'm giving you this overview, is because of that. So I didn't really need to do it. I kind of, it's going to work in there, but I, that part I needed to bring to your attention as far as why colonization was important. Um, had a lot of good feedback. I appreciate the love. And again, you never have to email, email me and tell me you love that you enjoyed it. You don't have to tell me you like the teachings. I just want you to get it. I just want you to get it because no one was there to really show me how to get what I'm talking about right now. I didn't learn the school of the prophets. I'm sorry. This is personal study time. This is my geek thing that I do. Um, and it is what it is. All right. So with that being said, I do want to go ahead and get into this, today's lesson. Um, all right. So what we're going to do, we're going to go ahead and pray. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to get down for the get down. All right. All right. Father God, I think I'm going to praise you for allowing us to exist, live, arise, breathe, have breath into our being, move, uh, have the activity of our limbs. So thank you. Thank you for not forgetting about us. Thank you for still having need of us in this hour and in this time. We thank you that eternity is holding back the hands of the enemy until our mission is completed. We thank you, Father God, for the Holy Spirit that is the paraclete that walks beside us and has the uh, arduous task of dealing with our humanity separating spirit from the from from natural and causing us to come into your alignment holy ghost i'm asking you to do as you always do you speak i repeat you lead i follow have your way let the anointing fall on every listener as well as myself today like any like not like not no other time let them relate. Let them see themselves bigger than what the enemy has shown them to be. And we give you praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so with that being said, today we're going to talk about prophetic mannerism. I'm going to try and get through all of it for the most part. Um, not that one. Okay. And as always, I need to pull up the separate one. So give me a minute. Oh no, I can do it on here. I'm 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 gonna be the small one this time. Um, unless the slide gives me a problem, and then I'll go from there. So let me pull it up just in case. I need it. And I want to talk about what prophetic mannerism is. And um, one of the things that we do with the curriculum, the reading, okay. The reading, the, uh, all right, there we go. The reading, the history, um, you're going to begin to understand what all of this was about and how it goes into play. I'm not a person to tell you to read this and read that and do this and then don't have a method to the madness. Everything I'm saying, you're going to use it in my school. You're going to use it as we, as we walk together, all right? So the contents we're going to try to get through today is prophetic timeline, mannerism, uh, prophetic traits. And that shouldn't be mannerism again, but, oh, you know what? It, that should be era of the prophets, which we won't get into that, but that's where we're going to be going next. But let's go on and continue. Timelines. Um, I may want to make this a little bigger so you can see it. Okay. All right. I want you to pay attention to this. And the reason is because... We talked about some of this, did we? Did we not discuss this? Make sure I'm on the right one. I didn't go too far. Okay, there we go. So here, remember we were talking about uh, prophetic history and whatnot. So I want you to look at this chart and you see the patriarch Israel, 
right? That's uh, 23 BC. From 23 BC down to, well, let me show you another picture, but just pay attention. So we have the patriarch period, we have the wilderness, we have the judges, the period of the judges. And then there's something else that happens before we get to the divided kingdom. So the divided kingdom means that they were taken into, that just basically means when Solomon fell, they became a divided kingdom. So we enter into what is also known as the prophet's era and whatnot. So let me let me show you another one. When you look at the same one, we see instead of 23 BC, we see 1050 BC. This is where the, the arise of the prophet comes on the scene. So here you see Saul, David, and Solomon. Notice at the top of that, it says kings of the divided kingdom. And then underneath that, we have kings of Israel, the north, because what's happening is that we're, first of all, we're dealing with a united monarchy. And that's what we're going to deal with today, Saul, David, and Solomon, because under this uh, um, structure, the monarch structure, prophets were not as, um, I'm not going to say as needed, but I, the way that I like to say it is this, where there is an increase of sin, there will always be an increase of profits. So when you get down to 900 or nine, right after 950, when we, when we get to the divided kingdom, that is called the era of the prophets. Right now, this is considered the, the United Monarchy period. And that's what we're going to touch on today. So I wanted you to see what this looks like, because when you get down here to 800 or 700, you start seeing all these prophetic names. It's, it's because the increase of the prophet is in full effect. You can't see this real good um, from where you're standing, but it was the best chart I could find. I'm just, I just apologize. You can't see it, but I want you again, if let's go at the top. So we, where, the, where you see it says the kings and the prophets of Israel and Judah. Judah of, is, of course, when they're divided. So they're united now, okay? This, this Israel or whatever you want to call it. Once Solomon finally falls, the kingdom is divided. And there are the northern kingdom is every, all the 11 tribes. And then Judah, uh, the southern kingdom, or known as the southern kingdom, the 12th kingdom is by itself. But prior to that, according to this chart, if you look st uh, straight up top, you see Saul, and it tells you the years he reigned, and the length of his reign. So uh, in green, I believe it is the time or the time frame. Uh, the gray is whether they were bad, uh, a bad king, I think is what that says. It's kind of hard to see it from this. Let me look on mine. Hold on. Mine has a much better view. Okay, so the length of time is the uh, that green or grayish period where you see the brackets. Um, the green is whether they were a good king. Gray is whether they were a bad king. And notice that Saul is blurred. Okay, I want you to notice that blue represents the prophet that was assigned to that king or that kingdom, that, that king. So the reason this is, an, is important is because we were just talking about plenty of potentiary the office of the prophet. So as you look at this teaching one today, you're going to understand that where there is a prophet, there is a king. Where there is a king, there is a prophet. Okay. Um, and then it has a whole list of uh, the prophets from the Northern kingdom, which is in the orange. And then the prophets of the blue in the blue are the Southern kingdom. That's what I just told you. So again, a good. this is good for studying. And, and this is also good because as we begin to go down, let me give you an example. Let's go down to the Southern Kingdom. And as you can see, this is just a different version of what I just said. Notice that on the uh, chart to the left, we have the Kingdom of Israel, okay? That's the Southern Kingdom. So I'm showing you that when they walked away from the things of God and were not, this was divided. And of course, Judah is down here in the Southern uh, Kingdom. Right across from that is pretty much the same thing you just saw on the other chart, uh, just a little closer where there is a king, there is a prophet, and where there is a prophet, there is a king. And so 
remember one of our big journeys here is we're still dealing with framework. I'm just breaking it down a little differently because I want you to begin to understand that what exists today existed in the Old Testament. I'm not telling nothing. I'm not telling you anything that's not biblical and you're going to see that for yourself. All right. But you need to understand that you are assigned to a king. You are assigned. Now, hear me when I say that. As a prophet, one that is called to walk in the office of a prophet and just dealing with the con dealing with confronting sin, you are assigned to a demographic of people that has a demonic principality over it, and you are responsible to contend with it. This is why the enemy fights your voice holding back. Don't say nothing. I don't want to say anything. Do you know how many times? I'm I'm be I'm being really honest, and I woke up. If you came in late, listen to the the beginning of this, and it makes some sense what I'm saying. I woke up with such clarity this morning. Not that it was foggy, but something I had been waiting on God to give me the release to do. And so when He gave it, I just you know I do my little shout up in the room because you know it's my business. But let me tell you why, because I came up under a structure where the enemy from a child was always trying to mute my voice or what they, when I started finding my voice and speaking out, oh, you're trying to take over something. So sometimes every now and then when I'm in certain atmospheres and I feel that spirit of judgment and that spirit that wants me to be silent and don't obey what I'm hearing God say, I'll say something like, I'm not trying to take over anything because that's my way of trying to explain to carnal people that I'm really hearing from God and I'm just trying to obey him. Isn't it funny? All these years being saved and sometimes you still get hit with that thorn of your past that wants to try and dummy you down or cause you to go back and to be in a place of silence. So it is important. That's why the prophet got to stay close to God. Look, look. I don't care nothing about no platform. What I care about is that I obey God. How do I obey him easily, as they would say? Some things are a little bit difficult, but what makes it easy is when I keep my ear close to his heart. That's what makes me do it. That's when those negative voices or, or darts that come from people, they don't affect me as much. So I have to stay close to God. Not blowing anybody off, not that I don't want to sit down and, and break bread at times, and I do, but I know what I had to fight. I know what I had to fight. And as a prophet, your fight is the same. Therefore, you should have no problem relating. So as we go through this first part of the monarch, we're looking at Samuel, Nathan. Gad is not in here, okay? But Gad was here during this period. Okay, let me tell y'all something. Y'all know I told y'all that they got different books. Don't be so quick to read. Uh, I think it's Gad and Nathan are in the same book. Don't be so quick to read because uh, Gad's mouth is crazy. It wasn't a cluster the way we would say, but to me, I thought he was kind of disrespectful when he put his mouth on David. But again, all prophets got flaws and they were definitely human. That's all I'm going to say. But they were the ones that existed during this time. And this, and the reason this is important is because, again, you're going to see the plan of potentiary prophet, okay, today and what they did. Now, when I use the term, um, and again, function of the prophets in a united, uh, a united uh, monarchy. Let me change it on here on my screen. Oh, I can read it from here. Okay. So mannerism, it is, uh, notice I have highlighted in red, a, a, a particular and or peculiar style or manner, a characteristic mode of action, bearing behavior or treatment or others. Now we're going to deal with traits later. I don't want to focus on that. Um, Dr. Price had, we were taught when I, we were coming up um, that there were uh, 20 traits of the prophet. And if you had all these traits, then you were a prophet. I'm a little older now and I realize that they're right and they are correct. But technically 
Everybody has them. Or has at least half of them. Humanity. Because if we're born in his image and in his likeness, then there are certain parts of revelation, intuitiveness, knowing things that you just get. Like, I realize it because I'm older now. So I'm not saying that they're not right. I'm just saying that that's not the way I want to come. And, and, and listen, let me say this. If you're looking or you've been to my school and you received all of my teaching, if God shows you um, something in addition to what I've taught that you have not heard me taught, but it takes you to another level, it's okay. I don't have to teach it for you to get a revelation another way. I'm not like that. Because God does not give every revelation to one person. And then what one person sees doesn't mean it's the only thing that anybody's going to ever see. But mannerisms are different. And that's why I want to focus on this. Mannerism, unlike a trait, is something that um, it is in your DNA. But mannerisms to me matter more. And uh, let's look at part two. It says, as we continue building on our framework, we're going to discover that prophets have had a way or a mannerism, but a peculiar style of manner of delivery. This is what I care about. Based upon the culture that they were called to, um, but despite the mannerisms, they had what I call set core methodologies. Our goal in this section is to pull out the prophetic highlights um, that uh, help to, to build a strong basis and to add to our framework as to determine a false prophet from a true prophet. That's what this is about. There are mannerisms that will be see, a trait of fool. Remember what we said, a nabi. These were, they could be a false prophet, but there is a mannerism that if you understand the mannerism of how a false prophet and a true prophet uh, uh, work, this is going to help you. So let's say it another way. If you understand how a true prophet, what should be some of the mannerisms that come with a true prophet? And though we're only going to deal with three, I'm going to cover a little bit more than that. That means that if I see something else that sound like God, smell, mm -mm, look like God, and is giving off a questionable scent of God, I have to compare that to what I know to be the correct mannerisms based upon the word of God. Okay. That's the big issue with them. And when we get to some examples, this is going to make better sense. And the reason that this is important is because remember, psychic from our definitions is the bridge, the deceiver. It, 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 it goes in between the bridge of the new and the fake, trying to seduce. And if you only, in other words, well, what they said was true. So they must be of God. Well, that's not true because a false prophet can give you a true word. Balaam is always a better example. Um, but again, we'll get down through that. So understanding mannerisms will determine what you're dealing with. Okay. All right. Uh, let's go. Again, kind of potentiary uh, prophetic mannerisms, all prophets should have these. We, first of all, we know that we are a principality of light. We must have an assignment. Remember what I said, where there's a prophet, there's a king. And we must have, though I'm saying territory or sphere, what I'm talking about is influence. You have an, you have an arena that you are called to. You are assigned to a particular arena, territory, and that territory has a principality of darkness that you are assigned to contend with. That's just principality. And if you see it right here, down here in the second one, you are assigned a counterpart of the enemy. You are the opposing force, according to Ephesians 6 and 12, principality versus principality, principality of light versus the principality of darkness. You are God's choice to contend with a demonic choice. Your mantle is your license of authority. Let's, and so what is the prophetic mantle? I got my scriptures up here. Okay. <laughs> Uh, the, the Hebrew is, uh, simla, man, which means mantle. It was an outer garment that was worn by the majority. It was also, uh, the largest of the, and the heaviest made of wool, goat hair, and perhaps in some cases, sheepskin or goatskin. The mantle was ripped 
to express God's grief. Or uh, according to Genesis 37, you can note these down. Uh, 30, Genesis 37, 34, Genesis 44 and 13, and Joshua 7 and 6. It seems to have been a large rectangular piece of material usually placed on the left shoulder. So again, this is back in that day. I'm going to go to verse, let's go down to the second paragraph. The mantle was comparable in some respects to what we call a shawl. No, not no prayer shawl. Just, just say that and could be used as a covering, a uh, bed covering uh, to bind or to wrap up articles. And so I won't go into all of that, but this is key as we begin to move forward. Now, let's go to Samuel's 28 and 14. And he said to her, what is his form? And she said, an old man is coming up and he is wrapped in a robe. And, uh, and Saul knew that it was Samuel, and he bowed his face to the ground as he did in homage. So what's happening here? Um, when, 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 when uh, I'm going to get back to the story. Uh, I know where I am. When I was, um, I don't remember at what point God told me this, but I, I want to share it. And this is why I have it up here. He told me, he said, Sandy, your mantle preceded your injury. Your mantle preceded your birth. Your mantle preceded your existence. So think about that. You think that because you got saved, that that mantle wasn't already in your bloodline? A lot of times, now, let's, let's, let me say this so you get it clear. Where there is the prophet in a bloodline, there is the demonic. It just depends who, who what mantle they pick up. It's a choice. So just because uh, grandmama Ichabob was in slavery and could read the stars, that was a valid mantle in a bloodline. They come out of slavery. She passes the gift down to her daughter, you know, Susan. Susan is mimicking what she saw her grandmama Ichabob do. That's not a good word, but it's what came. And um, she's going on in the things of God. Okay. And so she watched grandmama Ichabob uh, put salt down, uh, do spells, cut a chicken. And grandmama told her, or great-grandmama, whatever you want to do it, told her that this is what you do. You have the gift of sight, yada, 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 yada. You have the same gift. So now mama has already been trained by grandmama Ichabod that she is a seer, or she can just know things without knowing. So now mama has a baby. And, and now mama trains her the same way she was trained. So now the baby... Linda gets saved. Linda already knows she's a seer and comes from a bloodline of seers. Why? Because her mama told her as her grandmama told her. But this one is saved, pronouncing the blood of Jesus in the whole nine yards. She's not, you know, moved on the fact that you told her that uh, she was a prophet because she's already been told that. Stay with me. So what's happening is you see the mantle being passed down. You see, grandmama had the mantle, the daughter gets the mantle, and now this daughter gets the mantle, but this one gets saved. Here's the problem with this. She gets saved, loves God, would never question that. But some of the things she does is still witchy. That's the new word for witchy. When something is witchy, we're saying that they may not be a witch or they could be because some of their things that they're doing or attributes are coming off questionable. So, for example, um, let's say that uh, they throw salt over their shoulder or that they feel as if they need to light a candle for whatever reason or incense or whatever, because that was what they did to get into a sage, to get into a particular coma state or calm state. And so... She doesn't know anything different. She's prophesying in the whole nine yards, but there's, some, there's a question mark above her in the realm of the spirit. 
Okay. Now, put a pin there. In this verse right here in 1 Samuel 28, uh, when Saul was king, so on that chart, when we saw of the good king was uh, green and the bad king, the, uh, the bad king was gray. You notice for him, it was it was blended hybrid, right? Because that's what happened. He comes in as God's choice. He decides to kick out all the mediums, including this one right here, the witch of Endor. He kicks them out. He puts them out of the the, the camp, the kingdom, the whole nine yards, because he's God's choice, and so. Um, his disobedience begins when um, he takes it upon himself to do something that he was not supposed to do. Samuel confronts him. We won't go into that. But then he couldn't hear anymore or the hearing wasn't as clear. He goes to the witch of Endor. The, listen, the thing he put out, he now goes on the outside to get clarity because he needs a word from God. Be careful where you lay your head when you need a word of the Lord. Be careful who you seek when you need a word of the Lord. We need to stay there. Because you don't know what you're opening yourself up to. But in his case, he did. So he tells her, I'm looking for somebody. I'm paraphrasing because uh, she doesn't know who he is. But he knows what he's trying to do to get to where he's trying to get to. So make a long story short, she's able to identify Samuel because at first she says, I see an old man. And then, and then she said, after, not in that verse we read, but in the next verse, she says, I see the mantle. This is when she puts two and two together. What have you done to me? In other words, you put us out. For not doing what we were, for not believing in God and doing it the way you want it. So why are you coming over here, messing in an arena, trying to get me in trouble? Because I ought not be accessing him. When you read in its entirety, you see several things. And I will talk about this later. When I talked about earlier about stealing the word of the Lord, this is a good example. She knew she had no business accessing it, but she knew she could. So she feels like a setup because, wait a minute, are you sitting over here setting me up, bro? She sees his mantle. Your mantle, thank you, Holy Ghost. Your mantle is crystal clear in the rim of the spirit. You're waiting to feel a goosebump or whatever the case is. God wants you to understand the enemy knows your identity from the angel that had, that, listen, <clears throat> The mantle that comes with you in the bloodline, as well as the angel called to guide you and to guard you. So when God says your mantle preceded your entry or your birth, it's been sitting in the bloodline. So let's go back to our story and combine this. All right, prophet. I love God, believe God, know God. And I'm trying to come into, let, let now, now let me do this. This is the illustration. I don't, I don't have, oh, I don't have anything behind me. Let's say I'm holding a blanket. This is an invisible blanket. And in the, because we're trying to show you about the, the mantle. So let's say this blanket I'm holding is big. I mean, I can do this. I can, whatever the case is. The mantle in your bloodline, when you give your life to God, the mantle falls on you. But you don't know that mantle. You hear me? And the more you grow in God, the more you learn of God, the more you are growing and being fitted in the mantle. And what? And the mantle is fitting you. If the mantle is going to fit properly and become one with you and you with it, that which is not of God has to be revealed so that you can get it off of you. So back to our example, Mama Ichabod did what she did during a time in slavery that was needed. No judgment here. You didn't know. Remember, the angels taught them how to what? Cast lots, read bones, tea leaves, and everything else. We didn't come from an educated background. So these spirits operated in any way they chose and desired to for their own glory and satisfaction. 
but God didn't kill them because of the mantle. The mantle still exists. All right. So the, the next generation comes up, does the same exact thing. And many seen, and I've heard these stories so many times, many have seemed to be healed, but it wasn't to God's glory. But the Bible says that gifts and callings are without repentance. Okay. So now here you are, you're saved. And you knew that your grandmama Ichabod was like that. And there were some things that your mom did that was questionable, but you still honored and respected the mantle or the call. You got to be the one that makes the difference. In my school of the prophets, what we do, we take everybody we go through and we take them through. Um, I call it the sonic boom and I call it that because I invented it. <laughs> but we take them through a thing where we renounce every demonic trait, attribute, uh, mannerisms, because man mannerisms are something that are learned. When you learn how to do a thing, it's called a mannerism, okay? It becomes habitual. If you always get up in the morning and listen to your phone, that's a mannerism, all right? So for pro so when it's things are handed down, you're doing things because it has become a mannerism of the bloodline. But it doesn't mean it's right. So we take them through this to renounce everything that's not of God. And we ask God to take back the prophetic gifting and take out all of the impurities and imperfections that were came, that came down with it and set us apart to be the prophets of God, walking in the trueness of God. And we denounce every spirit that has tried to attach itself to the um the legal and the right uh, way to do things when it comes to prophetic for a better way of saying it. And we do this for this reason, because Saul is now blending the lines. He can't have his way. Translation. I need a word from God. I need a word. I just need a word. I'm going through a lot. Da -da 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 so you don't believe in buying a word because you know, it's not God. But you're desperate. You ever needed a word so bad and you knew that you didn't believe in paying for a word, but you believe you were going through so much that you actually paid that $50 and sold that seed to get a word? What did you do? You opened up a door where the enemy is thinking, oh, oh, they need a word. I'm not talking about the person. I'm dealing with the spirit. Oh, so now what we can do is we can open up this avenue. And now, you know, start sending them things. But if you think I'm all, go to Micah 3 and 11. Micah 3 and 11 says that the prophets were prophesying for money and the priests were teaching for a bribe and that they thought that God was with them and it wasn't. Okay. This is a good place to bring this at too. Okay, so today's lesson, we're talking about the united monarchy. Okay, remember what I said, Micah 3 and 11. Micah 3 and 11 goes, come down, comes down the line later where they abuse this. And God uses Micah to rebuke the prophets and the priests and the teachers for doing this. We're here in the United Kingdom. This is why we got to study. And this is not applicable. Because this is where, let's say how we got here. How we got here was the wilderness. They go in the wilderness for 400 years. Um, they come out, you know, Moses. And while he's in there, he's setting up apostolic order for Israel, the Levites, and how things are to go. And the Ark of the Covenant, all of this is what's happening during this time. So it was appropriate to bring a gift to the prophet. It was expected to be, this was a way of paying homage and being grateful for the word. Y'all see why Micah, 11, Micah 3 and 11, why God had to come in and deal with it? Because they had abused it. Okay. Um, so I'm, that's why I'm saying that. So when you open that door, I know, you, I know, I know you don't. Let me first say this, because I don't, I, I got to be honest. I was there. I went through some really devastating times, went through being married for 20 year, years, a military soldier, and watched him lose his mind 
had to go back and take care of him. It felt like hell had waged a war. Used to warfare. That wasn't it, but this was something on a different scale. And um, I'm not going to name the name, but it, it is something that you're, 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 you're comfortable with. You know what I'm saying. And to many of you, if I call the name, you would be like, well, I'll call there and got a word too when I wanted it. I mean, I think he's of God or I think they're of God. But I knew something that nobody else knew because of being in the school and going through my training. But my life was in such shambles. Uh, <laughs> everything was happening. The divorce was happening. Uh, the marriage, I had just lost both mothers that raised me. It was a lot going on. I felt as if heaven had abandoned me. And I know that that wasn't true, but when you're in that place and you're in those storms and them hurricanes are, are coming, it's hard to put things in right perspective. And I remember um, asking God for a word and he wouldn't talk. So I didn't think I was going into witchcraft. That wasn't it. But I did want a word. And I called the number and um, I got no satisfaction from it, to be honest. And God said, this is what he said to me. He said, you know what you know. And I taught you what I taught you for a reason. He said, I don't care how much money you give, you're going to walk this out because it is what I have ordained for you to do. I know y'all don't want to hear that, but I'm being transparent. I don't care what you, how much you believe in the source. If God is saying, I don't care what you give. Matter of fact, one time he told me, you might as well just put your money back in your pocket. You're giving the money because you want me to give you a word to make this go away or to tell you that this is going to end at a certain time. Can I talk to some transparent folks? And God says, I'm not doing it. You're going to go through it, get your money back and go on and sit down because you're going to understand why things are taking place the way that they are. It would be years later that I understood that. But at that moment, my mind, my life, everything was in a panic. This was not a storm that was anything I had ever dealt with before. So I'm trying to tell you, don't open up doors is what I'm saying. That you have to go back and repent for later, as I did. So till this day, I am very adamant on, well, number two, God told me you don't take a dime. You give them. If I give you a word for them, you give it. How dare anybody sell a word for money? Okay, what you dress it up to be? It is what it is. So that's why Micah 3 and 11 is different from this particular time. But nonetheless, um, um, this is the problem when you open up these doors and you seek a word. And, and in your mind, you ain't thinking about you paying for no prophecy. You're thinking you're just sowing a seed. You're just sowing into the ministry. Let me ask you a question. What ministry are you sowing into? Is it demonic? Oh, you think because they said apostle and prophetess that that's God? It could be demonic. Just because what it say doesn't mean what it is. Listen to the Holy Ghost. I'm just trying to help you. Hard lessons I learned. So here, tying this in together, you have a mantle that you're learning how to move with. You're learning how to grow into. And the Holy Ghost, and in other words, there are seasons where God takes you to regular school, which means his school, no school, that means. And then there are times you get the combination of his school and regular school and sitting up under mentors and different things of that nature. I have been there and done it all. Not to, to, not to belittle you, not to say you're stupid, and, and for everybody to walk around and say, well, I just need God. I ain't never been to a school. And, and, some, and the reason you can't go to certain levels is because you haven't really understood why he needs you to go sit up under somebody. Ouch. I'm sorry. I know it's funny. We're going to be here. I guess we ain't going to finish all this today. He's not trying to kill you. There is a right. The same way we talk about spiritual fathers and mothers. Let's talk about the way it should be. Spiritual fathers and mothers, they ought to give you a blessing. They ought to uh, thank you for your work when you leave, 
when we were when me and my husband and then we're in Germany, uh, we were under this ministry uh, for the whole four or five years we were there. Not quite five, maybe like three to four. And when we left, we wasn't expecting anything. It was our first church or a second church. And they gave us a plaque for our servitude and just, you know, being teachers and just being faithful members. They ain't never happened again. <laughs> that ain't never happened again. It never happened again. And I didn't know that that was not normal. And what I began to see was how we served, gave our tithes, taught their kids, Bible study, Sunday school. Y'all remember Sunday school? Youth teacher, youth leader, a youth pastor. And when you go, God ain't told them to leave. Mm. The devil with them. Da, 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 da. But you didn't say that when he was taking my money. God was teaching us how to be individuals and how to follow him. And sad to say it doesn't go like that, but it should go like that. Um, so it's just important that, and here's why, because you want the blessing. There's a blessing that comes from a spiritual leader that's really walking with God. And when you see them show their butt mm -hmm, and start doing that type of stuff that you experience, just know this, you did your season. You did your time. You did what God told you to do. Don't look back and keep moving until God opens up the next assignment. That's how you're going to have to look at it. And if you are a prophet, you will never, ever get a lot of honor. You'll always be made to look off and crazy. Uh, it's just the enemy's design. But when you get across a true uh, spiritual mother or father, they, are, they already understand that there must come the right of the firstborn. You must bless them. You must feed them as needed. You don't get to blow my phone up every day, but you do get access to me. You you know where I am. But as a mother, like now I have four grown kids. Okay. So let's be clear. They got access to me 24 seven, but we don't talk every single day almost, but every other day or once a week, depending upon how close they are, whatever. I don't run and rule their life. I don't make decisions when they want to talk, they talk, I let them vent, but I'm going to always tell them what God is saying. I'm true to that. So if you want a spiritual leader that tells you what you want to hear, don't pick me. I ain't the one. I'm going to love you through whatever you're going through, but I'm going to still tell you what God says. And sometimes I know that if you're really hurting and you're going through some devastating thing, I'm not going to tell you what God is saying. Or let me say it another way. Not that I'm not going to tell you it's not the right time for you to hear it. And you have a right to be emotional. You have a right to be upset in the whole nine yards. So we got to go back and restore the order of, of people understanding why is it important when it comes to the blessing of a spiritual mother, father. And I know I kind of, I don't know why God went that way, but I, I think that you need to understand that you're not abandoned. You're not left alone. You're not out here on some, some road or island walking by yourself. It's just that your, your next connection has not yet met you yet. So in the meantime, I need, not me. The um, God needs you to stay focused on the mission. You can only control what you can and you can't control what you can't control, but you can control your relationship with God. You can control and control staying focused and staying centered with God. Is that all right? So again, keep building up your mantle. That's a better way to say it. Keep building up that mantle by staying connected to him and watch him put things into place or get things prepared for you. All right. So within your mantle lays your authority and intended inheritance. This, I can't get away from it. This is why the right of the firstborn is so important. It was not, give me my money, give me my money. We're dealing, listen, we're dealing with this time frame. Abraham, Lot, the right of the firstborn was something that was given to you. It was your inheritance. Esau was crazy man. Jacob was a mama's boy but they still deserve the right of the firstborn. The older one, if the oldest child always got the greatest amount because he was the oldest, but everybody got a portion of their inheritance. How do we think we can just abuse people and use people? You're not here to just, 
I can tell we ain't going to get nowhere today. You are not here just to sit in a pew and give your money and just sit there and don't do nothing. No, you have a right, something to do in that ministry. You have an inheritance from that ministry. But when you don't know, you go angry, broken, confused. Sometimes when you stay, you're still angry, broken, and confused because you don't know what's entitled to you. And maybe you need to go into the room of the spirit and stop talking about the pastor and what they did to you and ask God to forgive you and then go in the room of the spirit and ask God, can I have my inheritance that was due to me because of my servitude? Come on, y'all. In your mantle comes your inheritance from God. That's the inheritance is in that mantle. There are dreams that I had being a child and I didn't understand it. I wasn't even saved, I don't believe. Now, yeah, I, I think I had it once and then when I got saved, it came. And I was uh, I was in my aunt, this, she's an aunt, but she helped raise me. And um, I was taken to this room and in this room, I was taken to this closet. And when I got into the closet, there was this uh, box. I did. I think I opened it, but I think the angel opened it. But either way it goes, open in the box and there's this beautiful um, regal royal purple that is, is beyond a color that I can explain. But it was just rich. But you, you understand what deep purple looks like. And when I opened it up, I took the, pulled it back, the drawstring, and I pulled it back and pulled out this little bottle about maybe that big. And it was uh, crystal and it was pure pink, the prettiest and vibrant pink I've ever seen. And the angel said, this used to be Daisy's because that was her name. And now it belongs to you. Daisy was a Jehovah Witness. But the call on her life was to be an educator. And she taught me to read at three years old. Put me out at five, but nonetheless, what God was saying is her mantle of teaching, you have it. Stop looking at people sometimes to give you something because they ain't on and they and they crazy. But there are blessings and inheritances that are in the bloodline that are attached and within the mantle. You just don't know about it. So I believe that from this and as you move forward, God is going to begin to take you in the room of the spirit and in the bloodline and begin to show you uncle so-and-so had a knack for carpeting. And he had an old hammer <laughs> that he always had and in the room of the spirit. God is saying you have uncle so-and-so's hammer. My spiritual mom who died some years ago, I, I ain't know nothing about her. I knew about inheritance, but I didn't think about it like that deep. But I remember when she passed, um, I was in this bakery and I kept, and I've been in Germany. So German bakeries are different and it was just smelling so good. And um, I'm walking through the bakery. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I mean, all types of bread. I could see the machines. I could see. Uh, it was like an old German bakery, in fact. Um, but everything was handmade. You can smell the bread miles away. And so when I got done doing inventory over the bakery, uh, I could hear the Holy Spirit say, it's yours. It was left to you from your mom. Talking about my spiritual mom. And I was like, she left me a whole bakery? Like, what am I going to do with this whole bakery? And I woke up in tears and I was like, but I didn't do anything. I didn't, I never sat and went to her classes or because she was always giving classes and stuff. I got my therapy on the phone because I didn't like people. True story. And um, I mean, no, really true story. So a lot of our talking evolved over time and years. And I was like, she kind of gave it to our daughter or whatever. Why did I get the bakery? And even I'm, I'm getting a little emotional now. You know what the bakery is? The Bible says that healing is the children's bread. 
God gave me her healing ministry. These are the things that when you sit up under the right people and you're connected with the right people, you get a part of that mantle to add to your mantle. You understand? So your mantle is made up of inheritance, but you'll come into them as you come across them or as God wants to reveal. And the more that you grow, the more you are being equipped. Is that all right? Okay. I don't know. God's just doing it a little different today. Uh, during the period of the monarch, the ministries of three prophets were named Samuel, Nathan, and Gad. A survey of the scriptures dealing with their ministries indicate that they function in three areas. First, it was the realm of revelation. They function as revealers of God's word and preachers of God's messages. Second, in the realm of intercession, they function as priests and prayer warrior. We're going to count this. And then finally, in the realm of guardianship or administration, they function as judge, king, maker, and advisor. Now, listen, we just talked about planet potentiary. This is not the era of the prophets, but yet the prophets are here. We are looking at apostolic plenipotentiary ruling. So here we got three prophets doing this monarchy, right? We got Samuel, Nathan, and Gad. They are functioning under the, under the three areas, revelation of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the rim of revelation, which means to be the preacher of God and his messenger. Two, the rim of intercession, uh, intercession and function as priest and prayer warrior. The rim of intercession. So intercession had a separate function, priest and prayer warrior. So you've been walking in prayer warrior, but you haven't been walking in priest. Everything I'm talking about, we're about to go scripturally, okay? Finally, guardianship and administration. They function as judge, king, maker, and advisor. What king have you made? First of all, I'm hoping you see the relevance of who you are to God and in the earth. Now let's go find scripture. Let's start with Rima Revelation. Introduction. The prophets of the United Monarch function both as revealers of God's word and preachers of God's word. The function of the prophet as a revealer of God's word can be seen in two ways. First, in title, ascribed to him. Secondly, by specific instances recorded in the Bible history where the prophets are shown to be revealers of revelation. So let's go see what they are. The prophetic titles, we talked that was the first one. They, they did it by title. During the time of the United Monarch, the prophets were known in the three titles of Nabi, you know this, Habi, and Ro, uh, Holtse, and Rohi. Uh, first Chronicles 29, 29, it is where we see Nabi, and it means a spokesman, speaker, and prophet. Uh, the title is given to such a person as an Abraham, Genesis 21 and 2, Moses, uh, Deuteronomy 34. So you're reading it right here with me, so I'm not going to do it. But these are the scriptures to reflect, to acknowledge, and to confirm that prophets wore the title of prophet. Prophet, I know you don't want to be called the prophet, but that's what God calls you based upon what? His word. So what is first mannerism? The first mannerism that you're learning today is that prophets walk and use their titles. These are the scriptures in front of you that confirm that, well, I don't want nobody to know I'm a prophet. Then you're not ready to walk as a prophet. You went, I, I never wanted the title. Don't, don't let me mislead you. That's not what I'm saying. I never wanted a title. Didn't care for no title. Saw how titles act. Didn't want to mimic that. But God told me this does not have anything to do with me telling you who you are. I am telling you that you call yourself what I call you. Here's the scripture. If you can't call yourself, you're not owning it for people. You're owning it to acknowledge the mantle of God on your life. Two, prophetic titles. 
The other two terms is Rohe and Rose, uh, Rohi and Hosi. Um, they're not the most common, I'm paraphrasing, but nonetheless, they are still mentioned in scripture as we see in 1 Samuel 9, 9, 9 through 19, uh, and, uh, with Hananiah dealing with, um, I'm sorry, Hananiah, 2 Chronicles 16 and 7, uh, specifically, uh, but in other contexts, refers to prophetic activity. In Isaiah 30 and 10, Jeremiah 1, 11, Amos 7 and 8, and Zechariah 4 and 2. These two terms for the seer, Hohi and Rotsi, are equivalent to the term of being a prophet. The three being synonyms. Okay, synonyms, and this can be seen, and then let's talk about prophetic activity. Prophetic activity, the activity of the prophet during the, the United Monarchy also indicated that they functioned as the revealer of God's word. So first we have title, we know that, that that's a mannerism. Then there is a prophetic activity that you need to walk in, and in this case we're dealing with being a revealer of God's word. So these are mannerisms that should follow every prophet. Are you ashamed of being a prophet? Then you're not right. Okay. Next, you should have the ability to be a revealer of God's word. Uh, it goes on to say, it says each of the three prophets we talked about earlier, Samuel, Nathan, um, they declared God's word. Uh, since much was recorded about Samuel's ministry in the United Monarchy, um, having references uh, found. So we know that Sa Samuel actually walked in several places, but we're going to get to that. Um, however, only one passage needs to be dealt with in order to confirm this fact that Samuel, in other words, that Samuel was a revealer. It's in uh, 1 Samuel 3. Scripture records that the call of the boy Samuel of the prophetic office in verses 1 through 3, the background of the story is given. In verses 4 through 14, the account of Samuel's call is found. And in verses 15 to 18, Samuel was, Samuel's first prophetic utterances was recorded. Then in the verses 19 to 20, the, result, the results are summarized. In verse 19, scripture reveals that the Lord was with him. Um, this is hard to prove. Um, and I know everybody wants to prove this. You want to prove that God is with you. You saying God is with you and God saying it himself is two different things. So sometimes you have to walk this walk out with God and let him do the revealing, not you. You don't have to prove anything being a prophet. And this is hard because this thing of, in the, it's, it's the crab in the barrel mentality. Let me show you who I am. Let me show you what I got. That's not how God rolls. OK, you walk with God, you keep in the uh, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and seek my face, then will then 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 will I you stay in that mindset and let God reveal who you are. So basically, though, I ran through it kind of fast. Um, what it's showing you is that that's the whole story of um, how uh, uh, Samuel was called by God and how God uh, the word that God gave him. So. All of these were the external attributes or the external manifestations is a better word. The external manifestations to show that he was who was, but nobody knew it. Was, listen, nobody knew it was Samuel. And Eli confirmed it because Eli was the one that said, hey, the next time you hear so on and so on and so on and so on, then it kind of goes from there. OK, so that that's kind of how that, that that goes. All right. I'm sorry. Did I skip it? All right. And then we have Nathan, the prophet Nathan, also function as a revealer of God's word. This can clearly be seen in 2 Samuel 7 when David expressed his desire to build the temple of God. God directly revealed his will to Nathan, verses 5 through 7, along with the provisions of the, uh, the divinical or Davianic covenant, 8 through 16. Again, 2 Samuel 12, God sent Nathan to David with a message of repentance. So what is the revealer? What, whatever God is telling you to confront or to deal with, that is the revealer or the word that God is revealing to you to take to the people. Whether it is David counting the people or whether it is David being reviewed, Nathan is assigned to David. You hear me? Nathan is assigned to David. Nathan was the one for the job. We're going to close on, on this after Gad. Um, 
Gad also functioned as a revealer of God's word. This is betrayed in 2 Samuel 24, 11 through 25. In verses 1 through 10, David had sinned in numbering the people again and, and had been convicted of it. Uh, God directs Gad to go to David with his revelation of judgment. Let me finish that sentence. It's okay. I almost can't see it from this end. I can't see the rest of it under me. Um, so let, let's let's talk about this before we wrap it up. Oh, it's only been an hour. Okay, maybe we'll go a little further. This is what I want to ask you. You think that God is grooming you to just be a good person. God is grooming you for the king you are to walk beside, whether it be husband, whether it be on your job, whether it be in a community, God is grooming you to walk where you're supposed to walk. The isolation, the reading the word, the prayer, it's not to make you be more deep or spiritual. It has an agenda. It's in your mantle. God is causing you and the man to become one so that when the time is right, now let's be true, David, listen, I, it get, I get tickled. It's, oh God, I'm going to get beat. I get tickled when I look at social media and I look at all of these uh, shows that say, let me use Mike Todd. Mike Todd did a wonderful uh, Easter program. And uh, the next day they took portions to distort and to say that it wasn't of God, that he wasn't of God, that he was on his way to hell and the whole kind of stuff. I was mad. Let me tell you why I was mad. Two reasons. Because my kids grew up with Michael Todd. Brenda Todd, his mother, is an awesome psalmist in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They're still there today. The church that God blessed their family with was under Gary McIntosh. We broke away from higher dimensions. So if I didn't know the history of this young man and could discern that he had a different spirit, which is why God entrusted him, I would look at this and believe this foolishness. But nobody did that. Nobody gave him the benefit. And first of all, they took snippets. People take snippets from your life and try to judge it. Nobody saw um, that this, the entirety of the production. Okay. But he's called to reach a people that most folks are not going to reach. How many times have people taken snippets out of your life and judged you? Be careful you don't do the same thing. So social media is a thing that we do now where we want to, uh, we want likes. This is all, it ain't about God. It's about likes. People that I once respected, I saw them dog and Michael tied out. And I was, and so I was heartbroken and angry because I said, oh, wait a minute. You're now showing me your true colors. You're now showing me, I thought maybe you were just giving the news. No, you're giving the news to tear God's people down in the name of God and under your title as being a man or woman of God. You're using something to get the likes of people to be accepted. Why am I saying that? Because right here with Nathan and Gad, both Nathan and Gad had to go to David to give him a word of rebuke. God ain't fitting you social media to rebuke you. That's what I'm trying to say, Jesus. God not going to do that. God will always have a Nathan or a Gad or somebody that has relationship with you to say, hey, listen, not always relationship. Let me take that back because that's not true. But in this case, it was relationship. Um, Nathan was more assigned, but Gad had his role in there as well to say, hey, listen, that's not that baby. That's not God. That baby, you acting up. Now, come on, let's, I'm going to need you to act a little better than that. OK, you may not want to receive it. And this is what happens when I'm the king. Who do you think you are telling me anything? You're going to be all right. But then there are those cases. It happened to me all the time. You're in the ministry, but you're not the one that people call to come to. But you're still there and you obey God. So then what happens is God will say, go and tell so-and-so. I said so-and-so. And this is kind of how he'll do it. I'll set up the time in a day. Don't do it in front of people because why? These are leaders. Respect it. Don't do it in front of their family and their kids. I'll set up a time, and he did it every time, and do what I said. And um, you tell them the word. And most of the time, they're looking at you like, 
who you think you're talking to? Don't, don't, don't bring me that. Sometimes they do receive the word. But at that point, your obedience to God is what is important. And the reason we have an issue and we say, well, God is not going to use anybody. That's not biblical, baby. There are times. Listen, I'm using scripture. I ain't making nothing up. I'm using scripture. God does not always come and tell you like he like that he didn't tell David because David was hard headed. And David had justified his mess. And according to the word of God right here in these scriptures, God sent both Nathan and Gad to him. So you can't say that God going to tell you all about your sin. That's not always true because you get to a point sometimes where you don't hear. Ex you know what? Especially when it's what you want to do. Listen to me. If you want a divorce, it don't matter how many folks tell you God is saying don't divorce. If that's what you want to do, God has already been telling you, but you don't want to hear it. So you don't hear it. See, that's the part they don't like. Now, the reason God is not using social media, I, <clears throat> social media is a tricky thing because you got so many spirits talking and people get a dream and they get no clarity. They get their own interpretation and revelation. And then they call it God. It's a mess on a mess, but it is what it is. Now, if you are one and you can receive chastisement, yeah, I do believe God will tell you. I do. I believe God will tell you because he knows your heart. He knows you're open. He knows that um, no matter whether you want to hear it or not, he'll tell you. But I'm going to tell you something. Contrary to popular belief, most folks don't want to hear nothing about they doing wrong. And who do you think you are to tell me anything? But according to the word of God right here, God put Nathan and Gad in David's life. Number one, because he could trust them. So let's talk about this. No, if you run up in my face with some foolishness, I'm like, God said, now let me say what I'm going to do. First, I'm going to try the spirit. Meaning that I'm going to try and receive it because I don't want to be arrogant as if I can't receive. I'm just being honest. I'm going to take it to God and say, okay, God, what is this? Is this me? That's me. Um, And then God will speak. And then sometimes I'll just be like, you know what, even, even if it ain't me or if they had another motive, God, let me go ahead and clear my heart with you so that me and you is good. Now, if I know me and him good, and let's say you come to me and say, well, um, God said that you need to, I'm going to say, be quiet more. Hear me. I'm going to question it. Why? Let me tell you why. From an external point of view, you'll look at me and say, she just too vocal. She just say whatever she want on her mind. The reason I have to go back and ask God, because God knows I don't say what's on my mind. I only say what he tells me to say. And because I know that the enemy has always tried to silence me is the reason why I go to God. So when God is telling you, say what I say and do what I do, and then you come with something that's counteractive to shut me down again, I have to go and pray. I'm just being transparent. I have to go and ask God, is this you or is this an enemy? Who are they coming in the name of? So this is a tricky part, again, about this. So I, I, I didn't mean to go all the way there, but I needed to go there because you have a right to, to judge it, but you don't judge the person and you don't say nothing to the person. Take it, to, the Bible says, forsake not prophecy. Don't be so quick to turn it away. Take it and put it on the altar and let the altar do what it do. Do you know how many times I had folks come to me with foolishness? Because they were jealous or envious or mad because I checked them or said, I've had pastors get mad at me. They love me when I prophesied about, you know, what I saw that was productive. But when they came to me for counsel one time and God told me to tell them, no, don't get that house. God says, I'm not, I'm not happy with your stewardship. Oh, I was labeled, locked out, kicked out in the whole nine. And one, one, one pastor wants to fight me, six, four. How are you six, five, but I'm only five, one and you want to beat me up? And I'm for real. You know, I ain't had good sense. So I was out there ready to go with them because I'm from Philly. That's that crazy stuff. I was ready to fight. Come on, put your hands up on me and see what happened. 
I, I wish I was making up what I'm saying, but I'm not. But this is the stuff that we deal with as prophets. So it is important now, first of all, was I his, his gad or whatever? I don't know. I think that he wanted me to be a personal prophet, but when I didn't want to tell him what he wanted to hear, that's the problem. And if you have a prophet that always telling you what you want to hear, and that's good, like in the case of David, they had to rebuke him because he thought that his number or his power was in the numbers. And it wasn't. So I can't tell you what you want to hear because then I become your prophet and not God's prophet. So God is building you to learn how to deal with dignitaries. And we talked about diplom diplomacy and diplomats. God is building you up, maturing your tone, your voice, your articulation. He's maturing you because he wants to use you in levels to where people can get to. He wants to be able to put you in the courtroom of David or Bishop so-and-so. And when he, he trusts your anointing, because he sees the mantle, he sees the mantles mature. He sees the mantle, she sees the mantle, and they want to come to you about certain things uh, and whatnot. They come to you because they do feel comfortable and nothing is wrong with that. But don't you allow friendship to cause you to alter. You tell them the word of the Lord. I don't care if it's the Pope. If the Pope come to you, a Bishop Jakes come to you and ask you, what is the word of the Lord? You ought to be able to say, with all due respect, I hear God saying one, two, three, four, five, and not be intimidated of the person or the opportunity. That's why God has to kill out this celebrity mentality in us, always trying to be seen and want to get with, with, with Bishop so-and-so. If I could just get a, get a part of so-and-so's ministry, and if I could just do so-and-so, that is your need, that is your spirit of rejection that still needs to be validated that still wants to be approved. And that right there, you can't cover it up because as your name get bigger, as you get closer to closer to where you're going, the doors are going to open up because it comes with the mantle. But if if, if you're trying to out your side of your mouth, you're talking about, oh my God, you know, um, I want to meet them. Oh my God, I want to meet them. Oh, this is just, a, that is the first sign of a trick. It shouldn't matter who they are. Because I promise you, you'll stand before David and you're going to say, you're gonna have to say, David, why you take that man's wife and why did you have him killed? See, now let's go back to the mantle. Remember we said that Nabi can be good or bad. So let's, let's use, let's use Saul because we saw that he was hybrid, right? On a chart, he was hybrid. So Saul starts out real good. He's real humble. No doubt in my mind. He was humble. The Bible tells us he was. So when did he lose his mind? When power set in. Prophets are losing their mind because, oh, I prophesied so-and-so. I gave, I gave uh, Nina Salong a word, Nina, uh, Nina Long a word. And oh my God, she invited me to come with her family. Look at God. Won't he do it? You think that's God? Or is this you not being content in the position and allowing celebrityism and fame and fortune to suck you into deception. We got to guard the mantle. We got to guard it because this thing I have you out here think, and, and, and listen to me. I want you to hear me, hear me good. We say this, well, I know it's God. I know it's God. Only God would open up these doors. And that's true. And I'm glad you acknowledge that, but here's the trick. Here's a trick. You get sucked in. Deception never steps out at 100. It starts at 1% and it walks its way up and out. So the closer and the doors that you see being open, be grateful. But baby, back out and run. You ain't got to sip when they sip. You don't have the... Oh, y'all are going to get mad. Oh, God. Wait a minute. Please don't shoot the messenger, but you're going to be all right anyway. Look. And I heard him say it, and I, I didn't, I didn't, I, I forgot about it, but we do this because it's a common trade as prophets. And he said, you tell them, I said, and they don't have to do this. This is what he said. Tell them they don't have to prophesy to everybody in the room. Tell them 
They give the word I gave them to one person and stop thinking they have to prophesy to everybody in the room. Because at that point, it's not me. It's your flesh that want to be seen. And because your gift and calling are without repentance, you think, oh, I'm just flowing with God. No, you in your flesh trying to be seen. Have you ever met people and they got to prophesy to you? They just can't say, hey. And then when they get done with you, they got to go to the neighbor, the whoever's, oh, I hear God, I hear God, I hear God. It's the flow, it's the anointing. Sometimes it is. But in certain settings, the assignment was only one person. And you did it openly and you didn't need to do that. We are having to show God that we are good stewards of what he gave us. Can I just, let me, let me end it on this because I, I don't want to end it, but I feel like God is stuck on this thing. He's trying to trust you with people. We keep talking about diplomacy and many prophets are failing at diplomacy. And you think that the more you prophesy, you're obeying God. No, baby, you right here on the totem pole. He can't even get you to David because you're still trying to be the, the, the big dog up in the room. You still trying to make sure everybody give you a word, and then this is what the this is what the prophets do in return when they find out that you're a prophet. Oh, come on, come on, give me a word. I know you got a word. Come on and pull that word out. Now we in manipulation and witchcraft. They didn't. I, God didn't tell me to give you no word. You came in the gate talking about you were supposed to give me a word. Now you want me to get into witchcraft and get with you? This mantle is heavy. He's taking you through what he's taking you through so that he can raise a mature generation that's not caught up in being seen. We got to stop. You so busy when your gift going to get you there, Saul, but it ain't going to keep you there. It's going to get you demoted and make way for David. So we look, we talk about Saul, but we need to talk about the hybrid nature. The, the thing that took him there, that got him there, but couldn't keep him there. Because power and control and the control of people is what mattered. Not God's people. Not diplomacy. And sometimes we tell people, you know, I'm going so-and-so. I'm going to be this and I'm going to be that. I want y'all to come on and go with me. So we're going to come together. So now you're building your kingdom. And they don't know no better because they think it's God. But you're doing it because you, you know that you want to make a move and you want to make it happen. And nothing is wrong with that. But when it is not laced in God's approval, when the angel of the Lord, according to Exodus 23, has not dropped down and showed you how to go and how to move, you leave yourself open to become a Saul. I don't know who this is for, but God is dealing with your diplomacy and God is dealing with prophets and getting them to understand, I have great places I want to take you and put you in. I want to put you in arenas to where they can come and see and trust the God in your life. And that I, heaven, can trust you. Whom shall I send, says Isaiah. And the Bible says, who will go for us? This is how we do it. The Bible said, who can I send? God told God, send me. That ain't what it said. It says, whom can I send? And who will go for us? We take all that out because it ain't about him. It's about us. If you read that scripture correctly, the focus would be on who's going to go and represent us collectively. Eternity. That's what God is grooming you for. That's why the pain. That's why the misunderstanding. That's why the hate. That's why the drama. That's why the jealousy. That's why they are afraid. I'm building your mannerisms. So because we're going to end here, let's deal with the fact that number one, don't be ashamed. You're a prophet. And when you meet somebody else that says they're a prophet, good. They meet the first mannerism. What revelation have they given to you about God and from God? Do teaching, which is good or personal. More importantly, what God are they talking about? I, I stopped talking about, yeah, I'm a prophet of God. Girl, I don't know what God you're talking about. I need you to be specific. Well, Jehovah, nah, nah, you got to give me some other names. Who is Lord of Lord and King of King? You better ask. 
Because these are the mannerisms that also follow what kingdom you serve, the title, which means whose name do you come in, and you ought to sound like the person that you represent. So that's all the mannerism we're going to deal with today. And then uh, we're still going to stay in the monarchy. As you can see, we got a little bit way to go. Um, but thank you for tuning in um, today. And we're going to pick up. I pray this has been a blessing to you. And I pray that you got something from it. Father God, I think and I praise you for every prophet listening, every officer, every going to be officer, every prophet budding and ascending as you have them to, to you would have them to do. I pray that it pierce their heart and that God, they're getting the right way and not the ebonic way or the shortcut way that will lead them to death. We got enough saws, God. I'm thanking that you're raising up Davids and Nathans and Gads in Jesus' name. Holy Ghost, watch over them this week. Call this word to wake them up in the midnight hour and minister to them where they are. And I give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, guys, thank you for tuning in. And I will see you next week as we continue on mannerisms. All right, dealing with, only dealing with, the um, United Monarchy. So this is before they became divided. And you know what? Deal with how they got divided. Do, do your own history search. Begin to understand why it happened and how it happened. Just educate yourself on some of those things and what was going on in that uh, context before the divided kingdom. Um, a good thing to study would be Abraham, how Abraham and the, and the Abrahamic covenant came into play. And then when Moses comes along, and it, the whole setup brought us right here. And it would just be a good history. Is that all right? All right, then. So you guys have a very good evening, afternoon, and um, rest of your weekend. And I will see you next week.